Well, everybody, on behalf of the MIT Activities, my attack, I want to welcome you to the Museum of Science Behind the Scenes talk today. We are thrilled to have the Museum of Science here um, at, to talk about um, the shared history between MIT and the Museum of Science. Uh, we've been working together for 150 years, and we're very happy to have um, Ava Grizard, the archivist at the Museum of Science, here who will give us all the details um, of the collaboration and shared history with MIT and the Museum of Science. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ava. And we had actually planned this um, event as a corporate member um, of the Museum of Science months ago um, as an in-person event. And obviously <laughs> things have changed, so we have a virtual one today. Uh, but Ava, um, behind the scenes at the Museum of Science. Um, so my name is Eva. I am the archivist at the Museum of Science. I am excited to do this talk to you guys tonight. This, so yeah, like they said, we thought about doing an in-person event uh, for the MIT community to come and take a look at the collections, do some behind the scenes. Um, MIT is a corporate member of the museum and it gets special perks, so we thought that would be an awesome collaborative event. Obviously that didn't work out, but here we are doing a virtual event instead, and thank you again for your patience. Okay, so this is my plan for this talk. I'm gonna talk about three sort of loose eras of our related history, and we're gonna pause for questions and comments throughout. And I'll start with a little bit of background history about our museum, so you have that kind of knowledge. And then I'll share a few examples of our crossover with MIT. I can't see the chat box while I'm talking, uh, but my friends at my TAC there are gonna keep an eye on it and make sure that if you have any questions or comments, they will get heard whenever we take a break. Okay, all set? And I think the giant thunder and lightning has stopped here in Cambridge, so hopefully I'm not going to lose power. Okay. So before I dive into this presentation, I thought it would be useful to just briefly define what I do as the archivist and where all this information comes from. Um, I think, especially these days, if you read something on the internet, you shouldn't just believe it's true. You should ask where it came from and how you know it's true. So I'm the first archivist uh, in the history of the, the Museum of Science. That's 190 years, so no pressure for me there. Um, and as the archivist, I act as the access point. It's my responsibility to uncover history and to make whatever that history is, the data, the records, the images, make all that available to the public. So that means unprocessed items and messy shelves and unlabeled boxes and like scary desktops that have hundreds of files on it. All of that becomes finding aids, inventories, uh, usable assets that we can share out to researchers, the public, the staff, our funding partners. Um, the point of archival work is to make historic information available. So if you're not making it available, there's really no point to this. Our history comes out of thousands of records that were preserved by former staff that predate me. Uh, a lot of photographs, correspondence, budgets, legal material. And I work with our staff today to organize and to understand that information and also to help them organize and keep on collecting things as we go forward. You know, I wanna make sure that we are preserving the records from today's project, such as our response to COVID-19 and our pivot to online programming for the last several months. Right now, I am especially grateful for our digital assets because as you can imagine, most of our collections are paper or plastic or analog materials. And um, so I don't have access to them unless I'm actually there in the building. Luckily, we've had three and a half years to get a lot of things digitized. And so what you're seeing are those digitized assets. So like I said, I'm gonna give a little bit of background information about our museum. And I like to start with this map that I made a couple of years ago. This shows all the places that we've been located in, in Boston. It's a little bit unusual for a museum of our size and age to be in a totally different building. Um, but we've actually grown up around Boston and many different sites over the last 190 years. Our museum began as the Boston Society of Natural History. It was founded in 1830. 
this was a group of gentlemen who wanted to talk about science, talk about natural history, natural philosophy as it was called, um, in a local way that wasn't dependent on resources from Europe. And this is pretty typical of the academic societies that we see in the 19th century. It's generally limited to those academics, a more rarefied kind of population, those who are wealthy enough to be able to afford to study and do collecting and do research. Collecting artifacts was a big piece of it. They would publish papers, they would exchange correspondence across the country and around the globe to sort of share this burgeoning research. Um, I would say that pretty simply put, the focus was on creating local education resources and providing access to that. And that's absolutely still what we do today. So we rented and we owned a few buildings around uh, Boston, as you saw on that first map, over the 1830s and 1840s as we were trying to figure out what exactly our society was going to be. So that includes renting rooms at the original Boston Athenaeum down on Pearl Street. Uh, we were neighbors at the, with the Mass Historical Society in the Providence Institution for Savings. We can see the, the drawing there of that early bank. Um, there were a bunch of cultural heritage organizations who rented rooms from them. So we had kind of a hub that happened around the 1840s. There's always been a lot of crossover, I think, between our institution and our neighboring institutions, um, especially when Boston had a much smaller population. It was really just a small group of people kind of running around doing all the same organizing together. So by 1833, we had our first display cases to show our actual artifacts out to the public. And that was a really exciting, uh, I think milestone for us, we could actually engage with the public to bring them into our space. We wanted to have a space that would be used as a convening kind of site for the public. And then by the 1840s, we were doing a series of public lectures uh, at our own institution and at other schools nearby, um, particularly at Harvard, with the intention of being an access point again, you know, bringing this high level expertise out to amateur or non academic audiences. We also had some important collaborations with government studies, doing some local natural history surveys that ended up being good examples for other states as they saw, let's, let's do some development of scientific resources about our territories and our new states. And these are just some images from our collections. So I'm an archivist, not a historian. So as I go here, I wanna show resources in case you actually want to learn more about this stuff. Um, so for the Museum of Science, there actually is not a comprehensive history that covers our entire development, but I put a link up here to this anniversary publication from 1930 that does a lot of good description of our development. It also does talk about our first partnerships with MIT. So you can get that link there. Uh, and then I also have some more contemporary kind of, you know, 21st century circa information if anyone's interested in that. Of course, as, a, as far as MIT history goes, there are a million great resources. So I just put a link to uh, one of the subject guides created from the MIT libraries that has some good maps, some good publications, and of course there's so much more out there. So in the middle of the 19th century, we started to work with MIT. Basically, as soon as you guys were founded, we were like, yes, let's be friends. Um, and the state legislature was interested in developing the Back Bay area. It was a new neighborhood that had been filled in, and they wanted to encourage schools and museums to move down there. So we developed a joint proposal with MIT, who was also looking to build a kind of permanent, dedicated institution. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not used to talking so much. All right, um, so because MIT, like us, had been renting rooms and purchasing sort of existing spaces, so in 1861, the city granted us a joint tract of land in this new neighborhood called Back Bay. And here's a photograph of our building. This is 234 Berkeley Street. Our building is in the front. In the back, you can see MIT's first building. These were built by William Gibbs Preston, who, and his father, Jonathan Preston. Uh, William Preston, though, is sort of the prominent architect, and he's a, a big name in Boston architecture. He does a lot of museum and kind of civic work. He actually initially designed uh, three buildings to be on this site. So it's supposed to be our Natural History Museum, MIT's building, and then the MIT Museum, but that third structure was never completed. So our building opened in 1864. 
MIT's building opened in 1865. Here's uh, just two more pictures of our very related looking buildings. Uh, these images come from the Digital Commonwealth, which is Boston Public Library's uh, digital portal. They've got incredible stuff. If you've not spent time uh, on the Digital Commonwealth, please enjoy that. But you can really see how related our buildings were. Um, and I do still frequently get questions about whether the museum evolved from MIT or was MIT part of us, because there is this historic association. Boston Public Library has not only the digital Commonwealth, but also they have a significant William Preston archival collection. Um, unfortunately, their arts collection has been closed for a few years now, but it's supposed to reopen in 2021, pending the quarantine, of course. Um, so hopefully that collection will become available again. But for now, if you want to learn more about William Preston and his Boston buildings, here are two articles uh, and a publication from 2017 that has a, a really good overview of the move that MIT, when MIT moves from Cockley Square to Cambridge. And it has a lot of images from the MIT archives also. Oh, and I have not read this, but I just put this link up here for, this is a PhD dissertation from a BU graduate that I just found out about. Uh, it sounds great, so I'm gonna try and get a copy of it and read it. And I know that there's a copy in the MIT library. So when the library opens again, you should request it. <clears throat> so while our society was getting established, um, local other institutions like Harvard and, and Boston College were also establishing their own natural history cabinets and their own science classes. And they were quick to collaborate. I really don't get a sense of competition from reading the records. Um, it seems more like these young institutions wanted to band together to put forward the importance of public education and science education in particular. One important example of this collaboration is in around 1860, we are part of a series of conversations with Harvard and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences about Charles Darwin's new book, The Origin of the Species. Uh, so these debates, they occurred at a few different institutions between like 1860 and 1862. Several different prominent scientists are involved, but I think the most famous one is a series of four meetings between Louis Agassiz and William Barton Rogers. Uh, Agassiz, probably the most famous American scientist of the age, um, and William Barton Rogers, of course, the founder of MIT, you all know him. Agassiz is a very complicated figure. He is as known for his racism as he is for his science, but he was also a proponent of like women's rights and women's access to education, so sort of choosing his prejudices, I guess. Um, but he and Rogers, um, along with a few other key scientists, had this series of public discourse and uh, articles being published that brought the theory of evolution out for a public forum and that's really important to think about it wasn't just happening up at this kind of higher echelon of academia and i think that that kind of partnership um, represents collaborations that we still do today between our different institutions we bring together disparate scholars different disparate audiences to further public understanding of these new science concepts and I, I have a few contemporary examples of that also that I'm going to touch on in a few minutes. But to learn more, here are a few resources about Rogers in general, uh, and specifically about the evolution debates. In this list, um, I've included Asa Gray's original review of The Origin of the Species, which is in the Atlantic in July 1860. Asa Gray, very prominent scientist, um, an administrator of our Boston Society. He really introduced Darwin and was a huge supporter of him in the United States kind of academic circles. So enjoy reading that. Uh, Rogers served as the founding president of MIT right up until he died. And I believe he passed away while giving a co the commencement speech in 1862. Uh, 1882, I'm checking my notes here as I go. Uh, okay, that was a lot of information. I want to pause for a second to see if there are any questions or comments and see if everyone's doing okay. Did anyone lose power because of that huge storm? We currently don't have any questions just yet, but it looks like we haven't lost participants because of the storm. Awesome. 
sounds good. I believe that the last words of uh, Rogers were bituminous coal, <laughs> which a very auspicious last few words to utter at the commencement speech, you know, and really ending on a good note. Well, that makes sense since he was a geologist. He's just committed to it. Exactly. No questions so far, so I think we can push forward. Thank you so much. All right, great. All right, I'm gonna try to zoom in on this picture here. Uh, coming back into our timeline, uh, this is a photograph from 1928 of the Back Bay, and you can see our building. So the society building is facing us. It has a colonnade that's the smaller building. The building behind it is MIT's building, which was called the Rogers Building after William Barton Rogers. I know that there is another Rogers Building in Cambridge now, but this is the first Rogers Building. And you can see that um, they are kind of complementary with the columns running along them. Here is another view with the river at the top, so different direction here. Uh, east is the right side of the picture. And this time the Rogers Building is facing us, so those big columns, and then our building is facing towards the right. Uh, unfortunately, this Rogers Building was knocked down in around 1935, and the land was sold to New England Mutual Life Insurance. Um, and later on, we actually sold our museum to them also. Um, so unfortunately, the Rogers Building is no longer there. The original Society Building is still there. It is a restoration hardware store, which is nice because if it was apartments or a bank, then I couldn't go around and, you know, poke around in there. But as a store, you actually can go and visit, and they've done an incredible job restoring it, as it were. Uh, and so you can get a sense of the old galleries and the walkthrough of what the museum would have been like. It's really neat. And if you want to go visit it and get a sense of the museum, let me know. We have the old floor plans and we have photographs and we can do a whole immersive experience. So we are still at Berkeley Street when Brad Washburn enters our history. And I'm sure that some of you will be familiar with his name. He's a really prominent mountain climber and photographer. He came to the Museum of Science because the administration was struggling with we had this really overcrowded, kind of decrepit museum um, it was kind of falling apart. And they brought in Brad as this kind of young, bright, bold new talent. He began on March 1st, 1939 as the director of the Natural History Museum. And definitely still just natural history. That's important because Brad thought that we actually needed to totally change courses. He closed the building, sold off the collections, fired the staff, and he moved us across the river to create a whole new museum that was dedicated not just to natural history, but to public education in all of the sciences. So on the left, we have our property in 1947 when we first moved to Science Park, bridging Cambridge and Boston. We're half in each city. Uh, the only building that was there at that point was the pavilion, which you can kind of see in the middle, the white roof. On the right is an image from 1949. We already have some construction done. The pavilion has become like a sort of temporary outbuilding. And you can see our east building, which is the first building is installed there on the hill. That the east building, it opened on March 12, 1951. And the new museum was designed to prioritize uh, large flexible exhibit spaces, as well as having some classrooms and workshops and supporting spaces. Um, but it was really supposed to be a focus on multi-sensory exhibits because this was the first museum purportedly ever to incorporate all the sciences and all the technologies under one roof. I love to see these transitions. We have a couple of photographs over like a 40-year period from this perspective. It's from an apartment in the West End and Brad Washburn, being a photographer, uh, would go and climb up and take these photographs uh, this year, actually in February, before we entered the end times, we launched a big exhibit in the building and we blew up a lot of these historic photographs. You kind of like get a sense of the scale of the construction and the sort of innovative development of the history. That now has become a virtual exhibit. So here's the link to that. So you can take a look at all these other historic pictures. So Brad and our administration had a lot of plans for this museum, and that included a planetarium and a theater of electricity, which is the next story I want to talk about for all of you. Um, it's our Elihu Thompson Theater of Electricity, and so 
if we have electricians, then we know that Elihu Thompson was an electrical engineer. He was really big in the sort of field of American electrical industry. He established the GE plant and the lab that's at Lynn that I believe is still functioning. Um, he established it in like 1890. And he also served as the acting president of MIT from 1921 to 1923. Now, we never worked directly with Elihu Thompson, but we worked with his widow, Clarissa Thompson, and she funded the creation of this kind of multi dimensional uh, electric theater where we would have demonstrations and exhibits about not just electricity, but communications electromagnetic forces, how industry uses electricity, all kinds of topics. And of course, the real highlight of this is the Van de Graaff generator. Um, this huge generator, I'm sure many of you have seen our lightning machine. Uh, it was donated to us by MIT in the 1950s. It's these two giant towers here. Um, we were making some jokes about it beforehand that the lightning show was happening outside, you know. <coughs> So Robert Van de Graaff, who built this generator, he was a physicist who was recruited by MIT in the 1930s to build electrostatic generators to conduct all kinds of um, experiments. Van de Graaff, he pretty quickly, he knew he wanted to go big and he outgrew his lab at MIT. So they moved their team up to an estate on the North Shore called Round Hill. And that was owned by Colonel Edward H.R. Green. He, Green is really a character unto himself, as was his mother, Hetty Green, who is also known as the Witch of Wall Street, which is really problematic. Um, but their history has everything. They have scandals and a wooden leg and really famous stamps and dirigibles. I really recommend that you enjoy those Wikipedia pages, Hetty Green and H.R. Green. Uh, so Colonel Green, he was... Um, very interest, interested in technology, especially in radio technology. So he set up a radio studio and invited MIT to come up and just utilize this huge property. Uh, along with Dr. Van de Graaff's lab, there was this airport that specialized in dirigibles and airships, uh, helium airships. Um, they actually had a couple of other forms that came up too. It's, it's unfortunate it's no longer there because it was this interesting, they had train tracks going into it, really kind of a busy space, but it's no longer there. It's now a golf course and the, um, there's a little beach next to it. You can kind of peek over the property onto it. So here's some photographs of that. You can see the huge airplane hangar where he built the generator. Each of the steel towers is about 40 feet tall. He completed them in 1932 and they can produce millions and millions of volts of electrical energy by moving conveyor belts up and down those tall poles really fast to accumulate electrical charges. But as exciting as that looks, pretty quickly I think it became overly cumbersome and outdated, so MIT offered it to the museum as a teaching tool in the 1940s. It took us several years to raise the funds to construct the theater of electricity. Uh, so here's two photographs from 1962 when we finally were in construction. And you can see the scale. Each of the domes, um, the, the spheres, they're made of aluminum and they're about 15 feet across. And here's a photograph from a little bit later on. This is, I think, oh, 1965, I wanna think. Oh, I should check. But, um, you can see that the theater of electricity is on the left. It's the red and white building all the way on the left. And it was a freestanding building. You had to walk across from the museum if you wanted to go see the electrical demonstrations, um, which is probably a good safety thing. Um, but I do want to note that the architect of that building and of several parts of the building was a man named E. Werner Johnson. He's an MIT graduate. He became, I'm not sure how he knew Brad Washburn as a graduate student and designed some exhibits for us. And then Brad hired him to do the theater of electricity, a major expansion of our West Wing, which is now called the Blue Wing, uh, and then kind of launched his career in museum architecture. So the name is very well known in that field. And he is an MIT guy. Now, in addition to these really specialized spaces like the theater of electricity and the planetarium, we had these extensive exhibit halls that we had to develop too. And exhibit design didn't really exist as a field in the 1940s and 50s the way that we think of it today. So we couldn't rent an exhibit, for example. There was no like commercial 
touring Pixar exhibit. So instead, we would call upon local artists and engineers and scientists uh, to help us populate the halls. And we also worked very closely with government and military and industry partners like NASA and Boeing and IBM to feature developing technology or historic equipment that was no longer needed. You know, nowadays we have professional touring companies. There are sort of collaborative networks that build exhibits. We also know now how do you present information? How do you make the content accessible to all learners? How do you move a viewer through a space? Um, and all of those standards and best practices are really thanks to the years of real-time development in the museum halls. Here's a few pictures from these museum uh, kind of developments over the years. Best practices around exhibit design, subject accessibility, all of that developed over the last 70 plus years. Um, so this shows our Foucault pendulum on the left, which we still have, of course. They reset it every morning so you can see it slowly rotating in the lobby. Uh, there's two sketches here for a dinosaur and for a space capsule exhibit. And then we have a visitor checking out an engine part that was loaned from probably Boeing. Technology is obviously a huge part of what we're trying to bring out to our visitors. You know, communications, vehicles and transportation, wearable tech, and of course, computers and um, wireless technology. Those are all common topics for our exhibits. And we see a lot of great examples of this in our Wicked Smart Gallery. I wish I had a, a thick Boston accent. I could say Wicked Smart the correct way, but I have no Boston accent, so I'm not even gonna try it. Um, but it's a great area that we use to highlight local examples of tech and ingenuity. I think it's a really successful space because it hits this like impossible trifecta of it being a, a space that changes a lot. It's always getting updated. It has really cutting edge ideas in it and it's really fun. You can hear laughter coming out of it and that's like the holy trifecta. So right now in the Wicked Smart Gallery, um, there are two objects on loan from MIT on the, on the right, you can see a 3D printed glass piece. That is from the Mediated Matter Group that's led by Neri Oxman in the Media Lab. And then I don't have a picture of it, but we also have one of the cheetah robots that is from the MIT um, Biomedics Lab that's led by Sang Bae Kim. And those various MIT teams who are responsible for producing these new technologies, they're an incredible resource to have right down the road because you can bring in ideas sort of in draft as they evolve and to show that to students that that's happening in their neighborhood or in their city I think is really powerful. On the left is a bunch of students who are just partying in front of the particle mirror uh, which is an interactive digital media piece it's really popular and that was created by Carl Sims who's also an MIT graduate. It's probably the most popular thing in the gallery. Um, okay I want to pause again and make sure we're all doing okay. Any questions or thoughts? Everyone doing all right still? We currently don't have any questions. Uh, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Just as a reminder to everyone, we are going to post this talk on YouTube. And when we do, we are going to also include uh, a whole list of all the fabulous links Eva's gathered for us. Yes, I should have mentioned that. I sent a separate list of links because. That's what archivists do. We, we tend to not be the experts. We're just really helping you become the expert. We wanna share out those, those assets. So um, I guess they'll put, we guys post that on YouTube. Like we on will, yeah, we will. We'll also, just to remind everybody, we do, we collect all of the different talks that we can from uh, our MyTech virtual talk series. We do actually have one that was run by um, the, the person in charge of the MIT Glass Lab, and he talks about this mediated matter um, uh, project that you see on on screen that Neri Oxman led, and I've got a really wonderful video from that too. So oh, it's, awesome. it's 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 nice to see these different crossovers between uh, the work happening at MIT and the Museum of Science for sure. Yeah, I want to see that when it gets posted. Those yeah, projects are absolutely. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's also well, a place where you see art and science come together because we have always used art to talk about science and vice versa, I think. Um, so it's awesome that the schools are also allowing more of that work. 
For sure. Uh, well, uh, to everybody, remember, if you do have questions for Eva, feel free to drop them in the chat um, whenever they come up, and I think we'll push forward. All right, let's keep going. So we use educational programming uh, and demonstrations alongside of and kind of embedded sometimes in our exhibits, especially in spaces like our theaters and our stages. Um, the educators are able to jump on really current breaking news. I mean, I've seen our educators take a headline from the morning and by the afternoon, they're like on a stage, on a microphone, explaining it with slides and a demonstration. It's amazing. Um, faster than we can with our exhibits usually. Uh, that's important, I think, because you're taking these complex, sometimes sort of foreign feeling ideas, like you see a headline, and you're like, I don't really know how that appeals to, or applies to me. Then our educators can sort of break it down and make it relevant and exciting or engaging to all kinds of learners. So we try to act as like a real bridge, I think, between the experts and the public. And in doing that, I think what we demonstrate that everyone gets to know about science, everyone gets to talk about science, it's a place for all people. Uh, one of our mottos from the 60s was, it's everybody's museum. I think I have it, I have a picture of that in your report at the end of the talk, so you'll see it. And I think that they really meant that, it's a place for inclusion. One interesting challenge for me right now has been trying to capture all of the work that our educators and our designers are doing during COVID times, um, how do you create engaging, memorable, uh, interactive learning experiences when you're doing it virtually? And how do you make that work for all learners in all languages? It's an incredible challenge. Um, we're certainly not the only ones doing it. I've seen a lot of great collaboration between administrators at our museum and the MIT Museum and in other local areas getting in the mix. And you know, you can't exist in a vacuum, right? We have to have our neighbors and our peers to help us get through these things. Um, one big piece of that is definitely using YouTube to sort of share out, especially with like if we could amplify our local experts. So I'm going to link, I have a couple of links for that. Let's see. So as we've begun not only creating new digital content that's available online, I'm also trying to digitize our old content. And some of it's like, I don't mean like laser discs, I mean old wire recordings going pretty far back in the day. Uh, and as I'm going through our history and looking at all these recordings of previous lectures and demonstrations, I can really see the history of our shared relationships with MIT from over the years. There are definitely these moments where a certain department or a certain um, speaker come up over and over again over like a five or 10 year period. So clearly there was some special relationship that happened there. Um, it's really interesting to see. This is a few examples of scholars that we've had from MIT, scholars and staff from over the years. Um, Philip Morrison, he worked on the Manhattan Project. Uh, Gurgi Kepesh is a great example of an artist using science and vice versa. He founded MIT's Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And so he's, he's as known for his visual work as well as for his education and his teaching work. And he oversaw several um, partnerships at our museum bringing MIT students in to talk about uh, visual approaches to science. And I just think that's such a powerful place. And then also on here is Dr. Stephen Richardson. He's actually not an MIT professor. He's a Howard University professor, but he was a visiting professor at MIT's um, chemistry department. And he was just on a podcast for us like a few, maybe about a month ago, talking about um, it's called, I think it's called lab lockout and talking about what are scientists doing in response to COVID and not being able to do their work in a laboratory where they are reliant on equipment, especially for long-term experiments. And you can find that podcast on our MOS at home section of our website. I do want to talk about this amazing department that we have at the museum called uh, Strategic Projects. They work to build bridges between scientists and the public and to find ways to make new developing ideas accessible. So, which I've been talking a lot about that, but they really pursue specific partnerships there. And they've had a lot of collaborations with MIT entities and departments over the years. Um, specifically the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials, that's a, a really sort of important partnership. But I've got a few other examples up here too that they've worked with. Some of the speakers on the last page that I showed, they were involved thanks to the strategic, um, strategic projects department. 
and some of these are partnerships that are purely research-based. Um, some have hands-on programs or lectures, the public gets to see them. Sometimes it's just embedding your research in exhibit halls and letting them have access to our visitors and to our communities. And I think it's just another important example of introducing the MIT world to MOS visitors and, and seeing how everyone benefits from that. For an example, uh, our museum has this new annual competition that we've been hosting where quantum researchers have to explain a very high level concept in less than three minutes in a way that it introduces their work um, and explains why it matters to family audiences. They do it on like a Saturday, it's open to the public, and you'll get families and school groups who will just come in and they have to bring them in and help them learn. Um, and it's not former, uh, formally an MIT partnership, but our judges come from the MIT Museum and a couple of academic departments. And I think most of the finalists and both winners of the last two years were from MIT. So you guys really know what you're doing when it comes to explaining quantum concepts. Um, so I put a link here for another YouTube link. Uh, the channel that's maintained by our strategic project staff is called Nano Nerds because it's a big focus on nanotechnology. And so you can see links to all of their speeches from this year and the past couple of years, plus a ton of other content. And that's just one example, you know, as I'm saying, we have years of MIT staff and students contrib contributing to our programs and exhibits. Like I said, I'm a new archivist. I've only been here for a couple of years. And every year we learn more about our shared institutional history and how important those relationships have been over time. So I've covered kind of a lot of material uh, and I want to leave lots of time for us to talk and for you to get to speak about what you think about the museum and MIT working together. So the last thing I want to mention is this very informal blog. Um, this was my quarantine project. Instead of making like sourdough bread, I made a blog and it's not a comprehensive overview of the history of the Museum of Science. It is uh, I mean, there's like no citations, for example. I'm you know, not a museum educator per se, and I'm not a historian of pedagogical development, but what I wanted to do was share resources so that if people are looking for a little bit more information about this place that we know they love, they can find an answer here. Um, and that's everything I'm gonna share for today. I kind of wanted just to, oh, here's the picture of everybody's museum. That's our annual report from 1964. So that's, I probably kind of touch on everything, but also leave room for us to talk. Um, if you have questions about anything I have mentioned or something else that you just wanted to know about, the certain memory or something of the museum that you love, I'm happy just to hang out and hear about it. That is the archives email if you want to get in touch with me and ask a follow-up question or share something. All right, uh, to kick things off, we have a question from Belinda Young. She asks, as exhibits change, does the Museum of Science archive them? If so, what is involved? Do you store the physical objects? How much documentation is captured? Excellent question. You sound like my boss. Those are all questions that we ask ourselves all the time. <laughs> um, so multi-part multi answer here, right? For components that we build, they're usually very, very large and very strong. We build components that don't break easily. And that means that they are like heavy and huge and made of industrial steel. Um, so a lot of that material we do not save. Artifacts and objects that were purchased for an exhibit usually get transferred to our artifact collection, which has a separate curator. And so um, we're not a collecting organization per se, but if we purchase, an example of an old-fashioned telephone, we might then accession it into that collection. It would be part of that collection forever then. However, if we purchase um, several sheep's skulls to be like touchable interactives for an exhibit, we might not keep those afterwards because they've probably gotten, you know, pretty, pretty beat up. Um, I have a pretty good practice in place, there always has been, and now I've taken it over, of photographing and filming every single exhibit inside and out. And so that becomes part of the archives kind of folio about it. Um, for example, we are, we've just opened uh, the Pixar traveling exhibit at the museum again. And so they've 
they've that's an exhibit that's about 10 years old and they went back and looked through all the original drawings and floor plans and measurements and re-photographed it and so there's a lot of kind of documentation around it but huge pieces we tend not to keep um Sometimes we just move it, like the dinosaur who's outside used to be the dinosaur who was inside. Well, we got a new one, so we <laughs> moved him outside. We actually cut off part of his tail to make him fit against the Omni and threw the tail out. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, does, that, does that answer that question? It kind of depends on the object. We yeah, also, I, we I also think it answers a lot of material. question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what do you <laughs> do with the, with the borrowed material then? So a lot of things are borrowed and sometimes it's a short term loan, like maybe it's for, we're going to borrow, a, you know, um, a quantum computer from IBM for two months and then it goes off to somebody else. Sometimes it's a long term loan, like for 10 or 20 or 30 years, because someone may own something, but they can't display it or they want us to take care of it for them. Um, it's pretty much it for loans. We don't do, they're also kind of like commercial loans where you would like rent a traveling exhibit, but we don't really do too much of that. We tend to build a lot of our equipment, either ourselves or in partnership with other institutions and other companies. All right, uh, next question by Lauren Platt. She's curious about your position as an archivist. How did the museum deal with the archives before and why did the position not exist until recently? How did you get involved with the position and the museum? And she thinks. Yeah, thank you. Really good questions. Um, well, so there have always been librarians and artifact curators and staff who worked there for a long time and cared about things and kept records. So it wasn't like I was walking into nothing, but there's never been someone who was tasked with full-time permanent kind of authority over finding, organizing, and providing access to archival records. Um, so what they did was just everybody kept stuff, you know, curators kept things, designers kept things. We have our records date to the 15th century, but they're heavily like 20th century and on CDs and DVDs, that's the worst, you know, that's the way, that's the bad stuff. The early stuff is fine. It's the recent stuff that's really keeping me up at night. Um, they just didn't have one. There's a, there's a number of institutions out there who just, you know, they're focused on education. I don't think that they realized that what they were doing was really a big deal and they should be keeping track of the history. Um, so I got involved with the museum in 2016. I did some strategic planning and consulting work for them. I was working as a consultant in the area. And they, at the end of that year, the museum received a very generous endowment from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, Michael Bloomberg grew up in Malden and has started giving to several Massachusetts area uh, institutions. So he made this gift and the museum asked that one little slice of that gift would go to fund an archives department. So I started in February, 2017. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it's uh, kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. And then from my colleague Diane, she asks if you could talk a bit about Doc Edgerton's connection to the Museum of Science. Sure. Do you have any archived materials from Doc Edgerton's work? So it's I, I was thinking about him, I was like, oh, that's an obvious thing to talk about MIT and MOS, but almost none of it has been digitized. And we are still, the museum is open as of this week, but staff is still going in in a pretty limited kind of schedule, of course, to be safe. Everyone's kind of limiting how much they move around. So I couldn't really go in and get those records. And it's like, oh, so I'm glad to have this question. Um, Edgerton, so Edgerton or Egerton, people say it in different ways. And again, I'm not from here, so I don't want to like mispronounce it. But he worked with the museum. Again, he knew Brad Washburn uh, in the 1940s. 40s. He, I think just because he was an innovator and an educator in the area and was interested in what Brad wanted to do, I think Brad probably reached out to him and said, can you be an ally to us? I know it are, um, I think it was when they put the cornerstone ceremony, they buried a, like a time capsule in the cornerstone and then they did the groundbreaking in like 1947. And he was there uh, experimenting with his strobe camera and some Polaroids and things. And he 
we buried a bunch of his photographs in the time capsule along with samples of soil from all the New England states. So that's buried somewhere. Um, and we do have a few examples of his prints. I don't know if we have any of his equipment in the artifact collection. Uh, we definitely have a lot of correspondence with him and Brad Washburn in the archives. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if anyone else has questions, you should drop them into the chat while we still have time. I have a question. Um, when did the museum start housing some live animals? I know it started off as a museum of natural history. Did it, did it start then? When did the animals come in? Yeah, so um, it's funny. Sometimes they joke about the living collections and the dead collections, and like I work on the dead collections. Um, when we were moving from Back Bay to Science Park, we were closed. We had no nowhere for the public to go for like, I guess about two and a half years. And during that time, um, two of our educators kind of put this mobile traveling science museum together in this station wagon. And they got funding from the Charles Hayden Foundation to put together some experiments and a couple of live animals. And they would just like pack this car full of stuff and they would drive around to summer camps, church groups, school auditoriums, all that kind of thing. Um, heavily focused on summer camps that were also funded by the Hayden Planetarium because, I'm sorry, by the Hayden Foundation, because uh, Hayden funded a lot of like urban youth going out to nature kind of work. So that was their interest and they would bring live animals with them. And that was our first live animal programming. And I don't know what our first animal was, but we know that we had, a, um, we had a skunk named Chanel number five. We had a two-headed turtle whose name was something like, oh, I'm not gonna remember. His name was like Double Dewey or something, I don't know. Um, and of course we had Spooky the Owl. I don't know if people know Spooky the Owl. He is a very important uh, early mascot of the museum. He's a great horned owl who, I didn't include a picture of him actually, that's terrible. I should have put a picture up. He was found on like some neighbor's property and they called the museum which would happen a lot. People would just call and be like, oh, I have this animal, do you want it? And they'd be like, yeah, bring it down. Um, there are stories of educators going on the subway with like a snake in a pillowcase and just kind of wild stuff. Uh, but so Spooky was found and brought to the museum and he was a, just a beloved mascot. Uh, they actually had a birthday party for Spooky every year and kids who had the same birthday could come and like feed him cake. So. <laughs> So the live animal thing is very important. We are an accredited um, member of the AZA. The, uh, let's see, is it American Zoological Association, if I had to guess? Um, that's a really big deal because it means that we are taking care of our animals at a level that meets or is above some sort of like national and international standards. And it allows us to do different kinds of programming with our animals as well. So that's a really, as soon as we could apply for that, I think in the 80s, maybe early 90s, we began to apply for that and we have always been AZA accredited. That's fantastic. I love that the skunk was named Chanel number no. five. Yeah. Uh, Belinda says that she remembers Spooky and includes yeah. a cute little smiley face. Yes, yeah. Yeah, he's, and he lived like a really long time. And when he passed away, we got like letters and telegrams from all over the world. Like thousands of people wrote to us. I mean, he was really beloved. There was also an albino um, porcupine who was named Snowball. So. Incredible. Um, and Trisha says, and now we have Cooper the porcupine to celebrate the birthdays for. How That's is Cooper? Right. Yeah, Cooper is the oldest porcupine in the history of porcupines known to man. I believe he turned 32 this year. His birthday is in like end of March, I think. I know we missed having a party for him this year because we are all home. Uh, that is not Cooper in that photograph with Brad. That is one of his predecessors. Hey, and we have uh, one last question. So if anyone has any questions, now is the time. Uh, Lauren asks, what is your favorite part of working at the Museum of Science? Oh, man. Um, I should probably say something about like the historic collections because they're important and beautiful, interesting, but I actually think that it is probably how much I learned from my colleagues. 
I don't have a traditional science background and I feel like I I just I like learn things about electricity and animals and you know technology things I just didn't know every day I walked to the museum and you know this week we reopened to the public and to get to go back through even with all the changes and with masks on I was like very excited to kind of start using my brain in that way again so I, I think it's just that that culture of education that's what I love. That's fantastic. All right. It seems like we have no more questions. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Oh, uh, yeah. Trisha just posted a link saying uh, he's, I believe, in, in reference to Cooper. Uh, oh. He is believed to be the oldest known rodent living in captivity and includes a Facebook link that yeah. I assume is to his page. Oh, oldest of all the rodents. That's even better than being the oldest porcupine. That's pretty good. Yeah, uh, Belinda says, thank you for the great presentation and the talk. Uh, thank you. Michael Sorry I had some technical difficulties thing. getting going, but I'm glad it worked out. And I hope that when things reopen, uh, people get in touch. Come ask us questions. I ask you guys questions all the time. I, I know some of your librarians and your archivists, and they're very patient with us. Thank you again so much, Eva, for a fascinating talk, you know, to go really behind the scenes and learn more about the history with the Museum of Science and MIT. Truly appreciate it. It was, it was a great, memorable talk. Thank you. Thanks. Well, take care, everybody.